hello everyone. Um, I just want to apologize first because I this is the first day I'm showing up for this conference uh, owing to a number of different issues, but I'm here uh, till evening in case anyone wants to catch up after the talk. Um, I also want to say that uh, th I'm a not a theoretical ecologist, I am a field biologist, a field ecologist. And so uh, my perspective is how do we take the theory that a lot of people work on and how do we actually use that to understand uh, ecological systems better? So that's my perspective. And that's what a lot of the work that I will present today will kind of focus on. Um, there are not going to be any mathematical equations in this talk in case you were expecting them, zero. Okay, uh, that's the only number per perhaps that will be presented today, yeah? Okay, so before I start, uh, I just want to kind of uh, start off by acknowledging the people who have made this work possible. Uh, this, the work, most of the work that I'm going to present today was actually done in collaboration with Professor Guttel. Um, I was a postdoc in his uh, uh, lab many years ago, and stemming from that interaction, we went on to uh, write a grant, and most of the work I'm presenting comes from that work. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, Bidyut, who is the postdoc uh, on this grant, who's done much of the work uh, in this work. Uh, in this project, but also to kind of um, the field data that I present comes from uh, two protected areas in Meghalaya. And so I want to acknowledge the local communities that live there and the people from those local communities who have been very integral to our collection of field data and their names are up here. And um, I just want to kind of say that I'm presenting this on all of their behalf. Uh, the faults are all mine, of course. Okay, with that, I just want to kind of start off by uh, giving you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today, which is basically thinking about ecosystem resilience, right, uh, in Northeast India, uh, which is a biodiversity hotspot, uh, and using both remotely sensed data and field data. So how do we actually uh, understand resilience, which if you think about it, actually needs data for many, many uh, time points, right? But conservation and a lot of biodiversity crisis is a crisis uh, there are crisis fields, we want information as quickly as possible. How then do we actually get a lot of information in relatively short periods of time, but with enough accuracy that we can actually predict what's going to happen to these systems? Some uh, initial recap for the first five minutes, just to set context for myself and for you. We all know that ecosystems are complex systems. Uh, there are a lot of interacting individual components. You could think of them as individuals of a species or species themselves which interact among each other. And you have these higher level hierarchical uh, structuring of these ecosystems. They can lead to uh, communities and these community ca communities can interact with each other, in turn giving rise to landscape features, right? Which in turn can give rise to these ecosystem scale uh, processes. So ecosystems are complex. Not only do you have interactions between members or between components at each level, what you also have are feedbacks between these different levels. Right? And it's the fact that you can have these different feedbacks and interactions is what makes ecosystems very complex, both in terms of uh, their functioning, also in terms of our ability to predict what's going to happen to these ecosystems. Uh, the important thing to remember is that you can't really think about the response of an ecosystem simply by investigating an individual component at this lowest hierarchy. So I can't look at a species response and think that I can then uh, in, interpret or I can predict an ecosystem's response. Um, also patterns and processes can span multiple scales. And I hear I mean scales of organization and these feedback uh, between these different components, both positive and negative actually allow the system to exist in various uh, states. Okay. And more importantly, they result in nonlinear dynamics, which makes it very hard for us to be able to predict very simply what ecosystems are going to do when they are faced with perturbations. Okay, we also know ecosystems are not static, they are dynamic, they're constantly responding to changes in their environment. Those are of course mediated through individuals responding to their environment. Again, this is how complex it is. Knowing individuals of a species will not show the same response to environmental conditions, which means that species themselves don't have one you know, unified way in which they respond to changes in their environment. And when you scale up, there's so much unpredictability that keeps getting added on. Here, for instance, is a coral reef. We all know that coral reefs are hyperdiverse, right? Uh, and these coral reefs are constantly responding to changes in their biotic and abiotic environment. You know, it could be temperature of the water, salinity of the water, the presence or absence of predators, herbivores, and so on and so forth, yeah? So how do ecosystems actually respond? And how do we understand these responses? So 
All of this you might be familiar with already, so please bear with me while I just quickly recap all of this. One way to study these perturbations or to understand ecosystem dynamics would be to actually look at the state of the ecosystem. Take some emergent property that describes the state of the ecosystem and look at how that property changes as the environmental driver changes. Right, uh, And to do that, we construct what are called the state diagrams. Uh, and state diagrams can show us many ways in which ecosystems respond. For instance, a simple way would be a linear and a very smooth transition. Right, As the driver value changes, the ecosystem changes quite smoothly with the changing driver value. We also know that there can be nonlinear responses of the kind where for an initial change in the driver value, the state of the system doesn't dramatically change. But then you have a sudden increase or decrease or whatever change in the rate at which the ecosystem state uh, responds. And then again, you can have uh, asymptote after that, right? And the most uh, interesting one of all is the one that shows uh, alternate stable state or the presence of uh, bistability, where you can have uh, catastrophic transitions between one state and another, right? Uh, which is different from this in the sense that here you have these intermediate states that are supported and you will see them uh, on in the field. But here these intermediate states are likely to be unstable and therefore will not persist in the environment for too long. Okay. Quickly, this must be something that is seared into your brains by now, but just quickly to remind ourselves that uh, this is an example of uh, 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 ecosystem dynamic where you see abrupt transitions between alternate stable states. Uh, the system tips at these tipping points or these thresholds uh, between the two tipping points, the forward and the reverse tipping point are not the same. Uh, and between that you have these bistable zones, which means that for the same driver value, a system can either exist in this state or in this state, and which state the system exists in is entirely dependent on the history of the system, where it's coming from, right? And that history results in hysteresis, right? The fact that there is a lag, uh, the system does not uh, uh, show a reverse transition in the same point where it showed the forward transition, that hysteresis could be because of the presence of um, the changing state environment relationship itself, right, or the presence of novel feedback loops that enter the system, right. Uh, and of course, feedback loops themselves can be positive or negative, and depending on which feedback loops are more dominant, you can either have transitions or you can have maintenance of the system in a particular stable state. Okay. It's actually not very easy to think, uh, to see these kind of transitions in real world, right? Uh, theoretically, we all are very aware of this. We have amazing mathematical theory to tell us all of this. But in reality, it's not, it has not been easy to find these because although the name suggests abrupt transitions, it's not like it happens overnight, right? Uh, but we do know that over the last few decades, we have some evidence to show that many ecosystems have either undergone these transitions or we have data to show that they are vulnerable to these transitions. For example, data from coral reefs, especially in the Caribbean and other places, people have suggested that they have undergone these catastrophic shifts going from coral dominated reef systems to macroalgal dominated reef systems. And this uh, transition basically not only changes the community uh, in terms of its composition, but also has a lot of negative impacts on the ecosystem services that it is providing to communities that live off of these reef systems. Apart from coral reefs, there's also the very famous, the lake system, where we know that lakes can go from turbid to clear water, um, uh, you know, in the same environmental space. Uh, and these transitions have also been studied uh, extensively and a lot of data exists for these. The important thing that we can take from these examples and a few others that people are now showing that these uh, transitions can happen even in vegetative ecosystems is that we can actually use a uh, readout, an emergent property. It could be turbidity for lakes, it could be coral density for coral reefs, it could be tree cover when you're looking at vegetation ecosystems, but you can use these relatively easy to obtain emergent properties and we can actually examine these ecosystems that span a lot of uh, um, area, right? And we can kind of then say what's happening to the state of the ecosystem and this makes life for a field biologist like me very easy when I want to think about how stable is the ecosystem that I'm working in. I'm a terrestrial human being and uh, I work in uh, uh, mostly forests. But if you think about terrestrial ecosystems, they're also very diverse, right? This is, a veget this is an ecosystem, so is this, so is this. This, as you can see, is dominated by trees, which is one form of vegetation. This is dominated by grass and this is dominated, I mean, this is actually a mixed, right? You can see grass, you can also see woody shrubs, but you can also see some trees. 
Yeah. So vegetation ecosystems are very diverse. And what state you will find the vegetation ecosystem depends on a bunch of different things, rainfall being a very important predictor of tree cover. And tree cover has often been used as this emergent property to kind of understand uh, vegetation dynamics, right? We could, of course, use grass cover as well, but tree cover is easier to kind of get from satellite data, and we have more reliable indices of tree cover than something like grass cover. Okay. So we know that among the many things that influence tree cover, rainfall or mean annual precipitation is one of the most important drivers. Here's a paper from uh, a figure from a paper from 2005, where uh, Shankar and et al have shown that actually tree rainfall limits uh, the amount of tree cover that you can have in Africa, right? Um, and so we can, if, you, if tree cover can be the emergent property of the state variable, we can take mean annual precipitation to be the main driver. It doesn't mean that other things are not influencing tree cover, but it is one of the most important things. Recently, and I mean 2011, um, people have, uh, there were two studies that looked at this relationship between tree cover and mean annual precipitation for uh, Africa, Australia, and I think South America, and I'm showing data for Africa. And you can see here, Similar, I mean, it's very simple, right? With increasing mean annual rainfall, there is an increase in tree cover. There is a positive relationship. But what is interesting is what's happening in this little gray box, right? That tree cover does not, or rainfall does not explain the variance that you see in tree cover. In fact, if you pay close attention for the same driver value, you have a bunch of uh, sites that are lumped here and a bunch of them that show this, this tree cover. Right? If you were to actually uh, use a slightly different approach to, with the same data, instead of uh, plotting every single data point, if you were to take the mode of the data, uh, which is what we did, you find this kind of a figure emerging from that. Right? And this is very similar to the kind of figures that we have seen uh, in those theoretical, um, you know, how ecosystems should change and things like that. And you can see here with changes in this, um, this is a composite environmental predictor. It's a PCA of a bunch of different things, but even here rainfall has the largest uh, impact on the variance of this predictor. And you can see that with increasing, say, rainfall, you do see an increase in tree cover and a rapid uh, abrupt shift from one state to another. Yeah? Okay. Uh, Sabiha, uh, who was also a student at uh, Professor Vishu's uh, lab, she actually came up with a method uh, that allowed us to infer critical points from these spatial data sets. If you had spatial data sets, can you actually come up with a method to infer these tipping points? Yeah? Uh, you can read the paper, I won't go into that in detail. So at one end of that relationship is here, right, where, where very high rainfall consistently gives you stable state of high tree cover, a forest, right? On the other hand, you have this end of the spectrum, ignore that one tree, but mostly grassland, right? Where at very low uh, rainfall, you have mostly grassland, and sometimes you can have barren land, and that's zero tree cover, zero grass cover, right? But in the intermediate, what you have are savannas, where you have a continuous grass layer with a discontinuous tree layer. But what you also have, which is very interesting, is this very close, uh, proximate existence of both this state and this state. Remember, for the same driver value, you can either be in a savanna state or you can be in a tree, in a forested state, right? And the question is, how is it that one doesn't invade the other? Right? And there is a lot of data, again, from Africa, which suggests that there are multiple things that are basically maintaining these uh, stable states. For example, uh, again, all of this data is coming from Africa. We know that uh, in Africa, it's a, uh, the feedback loops and interactions between both abiotic and biotic features that is maintaining these systems in these different uh, stable states, and the disruption of any of them can tip the system from one state to another. And these include you know, interactions between fire, um, uh, things like termite, predator, uh, herbivores, predators of, the, pre predators of the herbivores, and so on and so forth, right? So all of these together are influencing what happens in this intermediate zone. And what a system actually will end up being depends on these and the history, where it was coming from, yeah? Okay. The reason why, as uh, field biologists, we are very interested in understanding the kind of uh, the tipping point uh, and the resilience framework of looking at the world is because we know that ecosystems are complex, which means that uh, it's very difficult to predict their responses to changes and abrupt transitions from one state to another are possible. We have examples now of these abrupt transition at smaller spatial scales, which means that these transitions can lead to loss of ecosystem services, right? 
Uh, and so the question then is, how resilient are these systems? How far away are, are we from a collapse? And this is something that we hear all the time. Every other day, the, you know, somebody in the news is telling us, oh, the earth is about to tip over, you know, climate system is going to tip over, the biodiversity system is going to tip over. How far or close are we, right? Um, and the way to think about that is to actually look at now a slightly different aspect of the same suite of uh, things, which is thinking about it from a resilience perspective. Resilience has been defined in many ways. Uh, one of the ways is that it's the magnitude of disturbance that can be absorbed before a system changes its structure, right? Or the tendency of an ecosystem to return to its pre-disturbance state following a perturbation, right? So if I were a forested landscape, if there was a perturbation, maybe a forest fire, and there was reduction in tree cover, how quickly do you see the forest recover post that fire incident, yeah? And so the important thing to take home here is that resilience and the time right somehow are linked together and we can actually use that uh, to kind of measure resilience because if you just think about it right if you were to look at an ecosystem how are you going to say whether a system is resilient or not how are you going to look at a system and say is this forested ecosystem close to a transition or far away from a transition right if you had to wait right and observe the system every year you might be a thousand years away from a collapse you might be five years away from a collapse there's no way to say anything yeah so um one quickly again uh, just to kind of think about how we link time to resilience uh, think about this again where you have you know uh, this ball represents the state of the ecosystem this trough represents the ecosystem the different the states the different possible states uh, when the system is perturbed it can move away from that stable state right uh, and when it moves away it of course uh, spans through various uh, system configurations right and then it recovers back hopefully to this a stable state by looking at the state of that system at different time points right and looking at the correlations between each of those time points right the state of the system between t4 and t3 t3 and t2 and so on we can actually think about uh, a way to measure resilience right and that's this first measure the autocorrelation which is a correlation between two consecutive time points right and then we know that when a system is going to respond very rapidly right the time uh, the correlation between two time points the state of the system between two time points is going to be very very low because the system is changing so fast yeah so when the system is changing very fast autocorrelation is very low and we think that the system you know is going to recover faster remember resilience can be defined as time taken to recovery similarly when the system is going to take much longer to respond the autocorrelation is going to be higher right so putting those things together if you were here or if the system was here which is far away from the transition in what we would call a stable state you would imagine that the system will uh, respond pretty rapidly which means that the autocorrelation is low and that would suggest that the system is in a high resilient state yeah on the other hand uh, you can have many things that change the shape of that trough right things like deforestation for example or forest fire or drought that can change the configuration of that system making the state the entire thing more shallow in such a situation and close to say uh, a tipping point or to a transition you see that this has become much more shallow the system will take longer to recover right the autocorrelation between uh, uh, time the state uh, variable at two consecutive time points is going to be much higher and it also suggests uh, lower resilience so in other words you can use that trend in the autocorrelation right as a measure of resilience yeah and we know now that increasing autocorrelation across time actually reflects a decreasing resilience of the system right great i don't have to sit and stare at a forest patch for the next thousand years to know if it is close to transition or not i can actually measure right uh, uh some function right an autocorrelation function here which allows me to infer resilience yeah and we have data that allows us to do do that right and that data is actually satellite data right thankfully this is unique for vegetation ecosystems right we don't have satellite data that gives us coral density from the oceans right but for terrestrial ecosystems especially if you're interested in forests we do have satellite data from the 1970s the coverage is very bad until like the 1980s and 1990s but we still have 30 40 years of reliable data yeah um, and for example here's just a satellite grab uh, from somewhere in the northeast i think uh, and you can see that 
you already, you know, without being trained in anything, you can see that this perhaps will represent some sort of a high, like a forested area. Maybe this is some sort of a grassland or something like that, right? Um, so you can use satellite uh, derived estimates of tree cover, and you can do this across the time series of satellite images that we have. And we can use that uh, as the data set to measure this autocorrelation function. Yeah, And people have done just that, right? So here are two papers I've just taken as an example. There are other studies as well. Uh, this is recent from 2022, and this is from 2016. What they've essentially done is the same thing that I've described to you. From these satellite data spanning the last 20, 30 years, what people have done is that for every pixel, right, they line up the pixels together and they say, how is the forest cover changing over this time? And then calculating this uh, temporal autocorrelation, what they call TAC, right? And then seeing what is the trend in that TAC. Remember, we said uh, increasing autocorrelation is a measure of decreasing resilience. And you can see here in this graph, for instance, that colors that are very dark brown uh, corresponds to uh, regions that have very high TAC, which means that they are not resilient, right? And actually, it is all over the place, right? A lot of our ecosystems at the global level seem to be brown in color. But we also know that there are systems that are showing uh, dark, like, you know, uh, colors which are blue brown, which corresponds to lower TAC hopefully meaning that these are more resilient, right? Here is uh, the landscape that we are interested in. This is India. And you can see that at very coarse scales, it looks like, you know, there's a lot of white gaps, but it looks like maybe there is, you know, ecosystems are not really doing so well because there's a lot more brown here than there is blue, right? This is another study, one of the first that did try doing these kind of analysis. They also did this across, this is South America, the Amazon, this is um, uh, Central and East Africa, and this is Southeast Asia. And again, you see that a lot of variability, darker reds correspond to regions that have lower resilience and a lot of our ecosystems uh, uh, our, you know, terrestrial ecosystems are not as resilient as we would hope they would be, right? Okay. We also know, right, that the persistence and the functionality of ecosystems is dependent on their ability to recover, right? So we have this measure of resilience that seems so abstracted, right? You're coming from a satellite data and all of this, but we know that at the ground level, the forest is more than just a bunch of trees, right? And how a forest persists what happens to the creatures that live inside it? You know, how is the forest actually going to ch functionally respond to a fire that's happening at that point? Right? That of course depends on resilience, but also that resilience is coming, that that ability to withstand that disturbance is also a property of all those different things that are happening in the forest or in that ecosystem. Right? So when we think about what determines forest resilience, um, it's a bunch of things. One, diversity. We all have heard of this diversity stability hypothesis where people have tried to look at whether stability or in other words, the persistence of ecosystems can be linked to the amount of diversity they have. We also know it depends on the history. Was this site logged in the past hundred years, right? Does it have a history of fire? Does it have a history of some other form of human disturbance or floods or whatever, right? The type of disturbance or perturbation. A forest fire is very different from drought. For us, looking at just a satellite image, they may all look the same, but for a forest, they, they correspond to very different types of disturbances, right? And of course, the functional diversity. It's not just enough to have 10 different species, but what are the different functional types uh, that those 10 different species actually uh, correspond to? Also external environment, things like fertility, humidity, all of these things people are linking back to uh, the um, resilience that you see of forest ecosystems. Okay. So keeping all of this in mind, the fact that you can actually use satellite data, right, and the fact that we can use that information to actually monitor the systems uh, motivated us to come up with a, a question that is, can we actually monitor the resilience of tropical forest ecosystems in Northeast India? The graphs that I showed you previously were these global analysis of resilience, but while they are really useful because they give you a very zoomed out, how well are our worldwide our forests are doing, at the end of the day, right, we have to remember that each forest patch, right, is also different from each other, right? So we wanted to kind of zoom in on uh, more practical landscape levels and look at can we calculate resilience and can we actually say something that could be useful for, pe for people who manage these landscapes, being the local communities or the forest department or whatever. Okay. So 
So this is Northeast India for uh, some of us who may not be very familiar with the region. So it basically is part of two biodiversity hotspots, the Eastern Himalayan biodiversity hotspot and the Indo-Myanmar biodiversity hotspot. Um, and you can see here that the EVI, EVI is Enhanced Vegetation Index. It's a um, metric or an index that you get from satellite data, which is a proxy for vegetation cover. So high EVI corresponds to high tree cover or vegetation cover. Low EVI corresponds to low vegetation cover, could be grasslands, could be savannas and so on. You can see that that varies quite a bit, right? There are regions that have very high EVI, like tree, tree dominated and you have regions that have no EVI, usually alpine meadows and so on. There's also a lot of elevational gradient in this region. This is the main Himalayan range and this is the Arakan range. You also have the Meghalaya plateau. Just remember the relative position of Meghalaya because we'll come back to this state uh, very prominently in the next few slides. Uh, this is the Brahmaputra Valley and the Brahmaputra takes birth in the Tibet in the Tibetan plateau. Okay, so we know that uh, Northeast India is one of the most uh, diverse landscapes in India and across the world. Uh, we also know that it shows a diversity of habitat types ranging from tropical forests to alpine, alpine vegetation, right, to cold deserts. Uh, we also know from paleoecological data that these ecosystems have responded to past climate change, the most recent of which was the last glacial maxima. In fact, people have suggested that across the Himalayas, right, there was a lot of change, uh, change in rainfall patterns uh, and glacier extent due to last glacial maxima, and perhaps the eastern Himalayas may have been a local glacial refuge, right? Um, with all of this in mind, that they have responded in the past, we know that they are also facing a lot of threat today, right? Uh, okay, so that includes habitat change, right? A lot of pressure on these ecosystems because of conversion to other forms of land use, but also climate change, right? And we know, uh, and this is uh, some, not the data set that my students put together, but we did a review of data sets uh, about perceptions of people, of local communities to climate change in Northeast. And it's very evident that people are perceiving climate change in every aspect of their life, right? The most shocking thing for me was that I never thought that Northeast India would one day suffer from drought. Because we think of Northeast, we think of a lot of rain, right? At least I did, maybe not, none of you did. And I was shocked that for many years now, places like Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland have been declaring drought years, right? And it's really scary. Because although they might have high rainfall, they belong to some of the most high rainfall regimes within the Indian subcontinent. The problem is that that rainfall is in a mountainous area, right? It keeps getting taken away into the Brahmaputra, yeah? So, any, and people are more and more communities in Northeast, at least in the Eastern Himalayas are saying that they are facing immense water shortage, right? Which is something to be concerned about. So with that in mind, it becomes important for us to think about what about these ecosystems then? How are they going to respond to changes in uh, climate and other factors that impact them? So to do that, uh, we basically used a multi-pronged approach, right? Like I told you, we could use satellite derived tree cover data to actually reconstruct time series and to then get the resilience data from there. But we also thought it's not enough to just look at these satellite derived indices of resilience. What is it about the forests, right? What is it about the local perturbation, their history that allows some patches, for instance, to be more resilient than others? And what can we learn from that? And how can we actually manage these forests going forward. So we use this top down meets bottom up approach where we use satellite data, but we also have done field work to literally map out trees in a, a vegetation plot and to see what species, what is the composition and how it's changing in the landscape and so on. Yeah. Uh, to do this, we answered three questions to kind of understand this. First is we wanted to characterize that relationship between tree cover and mean annual rainfall. We have these global studies that show us what these relationships are, but what is it for the landscape here? Just to remind you again, uh, because it is a high rainfall regime area, right? A lot of the ecosystems here are actually forested, but we also have alpine meadows. We also have flooded grasslands, especially in the Brahmaputra Valley. We also have other Things like Shola, I don't know if you're familiar with the Shola grassland system in Western Ghats. We also have those kind of systems in the Dzuku Valley. So we do have many different types of ecosystems. It's not just forests in the North, in Northeast India, right? So keeping that in mind, we wanted to characterize these relation, this relationship. We also wanted to then use uh, remotely sensed data to kind of then uh, obtain uh, autocorrelation uh, values and then 
infer resilience from that. And of course, to go back and say, what is it about the forest uh, that is correlated with these uh, resilience values? And like I said, almost all of this work was either done by Vidyut or uh, coordinated by him, who he was a postdoc on this project. Um, and it's uh, a lot of work, as you will see. Okay. So here again is the map of Northeast India. You can see that this is a map of EVI, which shows you how vegetation cover is changing across the landscape. I won't go through this. This is a map uh, showing the change in rainfall. And you can see that there is a lot of spatial variation in rainfall as well. Uh, you have, of course, you don't have rain, very arid regions in Northeast India. Rainfall doesn't fall below 600 mm of rainfall. So it is in a relatively medium to high rainfall regime. In other parts of India, just to give you context, you can have areas that go down to 200, uh, 300, uh, even less mm of rainfall, right? The semi-arid landscape that we are all literally sitting in right now. Um, what we did then is to construct these state diagrams. Basically, I don't know if you can see this little blob over here. This is supposed to be a polygon. Uh, we constructed these polygons for every 100 mm rainfall bin. So 600 to 700, 700 to 800. And all the pixels that fall uh, within that rainfall regime, right? We got those pixels. And for those pixels, we looked at the distribution of EVI, right? And from that, we obtained the mode of the EVI, right? And we plotted that mode of that EVI for each rainfall bin as a function of that rainfall bin. Um, and this is what we look like, yeah? Very different from what you'll expect. We don't actually see these alternate stable states, that diagram that we think of as being uh, indicative of alternate stable states, we don't recover that in Northeast India, right? I told you going in that there are many grasslands and there are floodplains and there are all these different landscapes and ecosystems within Northeast, but it doesn't show up because they are very small in scale. So if I were to do this maybe for each individual state or each individual landscape, maybe they'll pop up, but at this point they don't. What we in turn see is something that looks maybe similar to this, right? Which is, you see that between 1000 and 2000 mm of rainfall, there is a rapid increase in EVI, right? But it stabilizes again beyond 2000 mm of rainfall. 2000 mm of rainfall is a lot of rainfall. Yeah, um, so it stabilizes and you only have forests, uh, anything beyond that. Um, another very important thing that changes in Himalayas, I told you before, was elevation, right? So the qu first question you will think of is, could this just be some sort of a pattern that is um, you know, influenced by elevational patterns? We don't actually find that. We find that this pattern is only recovered for rainfall, not for elevation, right? With elevation, it's just a linear declining trend. Okay. So coming back, so we, now we've characterized the state. We want to see actually how resilience changes. Uh, reminding ourselves again that increasing autocorrelation suggests a decreasing resilience of the ecosystem. So what we do is essentially we take time series data from satellite image. Each pixel right, uh, from every image is basically the time series analyzed, the pixel value over that time, entire time duration. And from this, we calculate autocorrelation function and resilience. Yeah. Uh, just to remind us of this picture again, you can ignore it for now. Okay, so remember I asked you to remember what Meghalaya is. So this is the landscape. Instead of doing this for all of Northeast, like I said, uh, we wanted to do this resilience mapping for smaller landscapes so that we can actually go back and look at that system and understand it better. So we are focusing mostly in this, for this talk, we've done this in four different landscapes, two areas in Meghalaya and two areas we're going to do in Arunachal Pradesh. But I'm only going to focus on the story on one region. This is the state of Meghalaya. And within this, somewhere here, the, the light quality is bad, but there's a slightly darker bit that looks like a swimming elephant. Right, And that swimming elephant here uh, is actually Balpakram National Park. Uh, it's a protected area. Here it is. Um, it's a, a landscape that is uh, very sacred to the Garo people. This is found in the South Garo Hills. Uh, and so it has been uh, managed uh, and stewarded by these people for many hundreds of thousands of years. It is now a protected area. And you can see the little slight bald patch here. Yeah, it's actually literally a bald patch. It's a savanna in the middle of this forested landscape. And this is on a plateau. Right? So there's a plateau, and on uh, this side of the plateau is a very steep ravine. Right? And you'll see why that makes a big difference. It's a very steep fall from here to there. Uh, and this is a little bit shallower in terms of that elevational uh, gradient. But all of this is a hilly landscape, uh, except for this little plateau. OK, so with this in mind, uh, let's quickly look at what, how, do we actually, how do we actually calculate resilience. So we used this MODIS satellite data, which is freely available from 2000 onwards. And we did this for 20 years. 
19 years, uh, at one kilometer and 500 meter scale uh, resolution. Uh, we used linear regression based detrending method. Uh, we calculated the autocorrelation function at lag one, and all of this was done in the Google Earth Engine server. You can imagine the kind of landscape this is. There must be millions of pixels, right? We're not talking about 10 pixels, 20 pixels, especially if you're doing it for Meghalaya or even for Balpakram, there are, we're, we're dealing with hundred thousands of pixels. Most computers will not be able to deal with it, but thankfully there is the Google Earth Engine, which is a server-based analytical platform that Google makes freely available. So we can analyze all of this uh, on the cloud without ever downloading a single satellite image. Okay, so we did two things, okay? One is we examined every image in the data set. The MODIS satellite passes every point on Earth once every 16 days. So you have a satellite image for a given site every 16 days, yeah? Uh, so we took every data point in that data set. So that's about 22 to 24 data points per year for every pixel over 20 years. That's a lot of data, right? Uh, and we did the linear autocorrelation and we did all of those things for that data set, which we call the full data set. We also thought, okay, let's see how much sampling makes a difference to our measure of resilience, right? So we also did this thing. Uh, remember across the year, uh, EVI or vegetation shows a cyclical pattern, right? So it increases during the monsoon and it has the lowest during the dry seasons when water becomes limiting. It's not limiting per se, but it's much less water in the system. So to kind of uh, remove that tempo or that seasonal variation, we then took one data point for a year. So I'm going to show you either on the 1st or the 2nd of January, every single year, right? We have a data point for every pixel, right? So we just took that one data point and we also constructed the time series from that, which means we only have 20 points, right? But there's no seasonal variation. Our detrending should be much stronger because there are no seasonal trends in the first place, right? So I'll show you results for both. They're kind of similar, but interesting things. So here's a map, right, of resilience. Don't worry about it. I'll walk you through it. Uh, this is Balpak Rabba again. Remember that flying... Uh, elephant. Um, the colors here in, are indicative of the autocorrelation function that we've measured. Uh, colors which are blue-green correspond to regions that have low autocorrelation, right, uh, which means that they are high res resilience. And colors which are yellow-orange uh, correspond to regions that have uh, high uh, autocorrelation function, which means they're lower in resilience. So if you look at this map, this is a protected area, just to remind us again, which means that currently there's not a lot of human activity going on within these landscapes. There's no agriculture uh, and a lot of different other, you know, you can't go and put in a mine or a dam or something like that easily. So they are, they are protected. And what we can see immediately is that even within this protected area, resilience does vary quite a bit spatially, right? So there are regions that show high resilience. Remember, this was the plateau right? That's why the topology makes a big difference, perhaps because it is so much more difficult topo topographically to access. It's possible that these regions have remained relatively undisturbed, right? Even in the past. So they show up as regions which have re relatively high resilience, but the border, mostly the boundaries show lower resilience. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is for the full data set. This is data every 16 days, yeah, for 20 years. We also did the same thing with data from one uh, image a year. And you see similar patterns, but it's not exactly the same. We do see again that uh, regions like this, right? This, this part, which was, you can see here also has pretty high resilience. Even here we picked those up, but there are some differences. We also picked this up as a low resilience region. So I suspect that this is perhaps really some place that has seen a lot of disturbance and is not really resilient. We are kind of trying to play around with our data, which is why I've put here everywhere preliminary data. We are kind of uh, um, uh, tweaking our uh, parameter space right now and hopefully it won't change much, but uh, the story is here to stay, but yeah, updated version sometime later. But anyway, so we know now that resilience varies across this landscape. Right. The question uh, oh, before that, I just want to kind of bring you back to what could be causing this change in resilience. Right. First of all, in many parts of Northeast India, if you're not aware, they practice what is called a slash and burn agriculture. Right. So forest patches are burnt down. Uh, agriculture is uh, conducted. And then after a few years, they abandon that plot and they move to a different plot. When this plot is abandoned, it's abandoned for relatively long periods of time, sometimes up to 15 years or so. So you have secondary forests growing, right? And subsequently, the cycle will move and will come back to this, right? Not all patches necessarily are game 
to Joom cultivation. Sometimes the village has boundaries and saying only this patch comes under Joom. But uh, what, I'm, what that means practically is that there is fire in the landscape. And this fire is mostly anthropogenic fire. Right? And you can see this is for all of Meghalaya. You can see that there is quite a bit of fire. Uh, this is for 20 years I've calculated fire frequency. And I think uh, the highest fire frequency we saw is there were about maybe 20 sites that had 17 fires in 20 years, right? So they're being burnt very regularly. May or may not be for June, maybe for other things. There's also a lot of coal production and so on in these landscapes. Uh, but what is interesting is that if you zoom into Balpakram, right, which is a landscape we are interested in, there is much less fire for reasons because it is protected. But you do find that there have been some fire incidences in the past. So, and these correspond to areas which again show lower resilience, right? Although fire is not very important for Balpakram, it is important in the overall landscape. And there is some fire in Balpakram as well. The other thing is forest loss. Have we actually lost forest in these regions? And here I'm using data from Hansen et al. Uh, it's a very famous data set that was published uh, in 2015 or 16. Uh, and that basically mapped for the entire world uh, forest loss and gain, right, up till 2014. So we're using that data. There's an updated data that also includes data until 2019, but I'm just using the 2014 one. Every pixel that has green color suggests that it's a forest patch. The green corresponds to forest. Red corresponds to loss of forest blue corresponds to gain of forest. And you can see again, the plateau, which is a savanna, is not a forest, so it doesn't get added in any green. But you can see here, for instance, quite a few red pixels, right? And so here. Yeah, so there is some sort of forest loss. We don't know if it is because of deforestation or other disturbances. I don't know the cause of this forest loss, but we know that there has been forest loss in these regions. Again, going back to that map that I showed you, these are the regions that correspond to low resilience areas. Yeah, okay. Like I said, low resilience, high resilience. What is it about these forests that actually show us these differences? So we went back to the field and we looked at the structure, composition and functional traits of plants across this landscape. What we do is basically we picked relatively randomly sites that spanned both this area. Basically, this is a little hard to get to. So we span this area and this area and we put these vegetation plots and the postdoc went in and actually for each of those vegetation plots did a complete enumeration of all the tree species that are present within that plot. Um, as you can imagine, this is a lot of hard work. Uh, here, Vidyut and Daniela, uh, and with, this is Tushar and this is James, they're actually collecting data in the field. They also collected functional trait data, which means that we take measurements of tree uh, girth, tree height, leaf shape, uh, leaf size, and so on. Not easy. You'd imagine it would be very easy to do. It's really tough to do these things in the field. Um, and we are still analyzing this data. So sorry, I can't give you any cool stories about how resilience maps back to forest structure. Uh, hopefully in the next few months, we will have a complete data set um, that will allow us to do that. But um, yeah. Okay. So to kind of summarize again, our approach, our approach was to kind of say, let's look at resilience, right? Using that theoretical framework that we're all familiar with. But let's look at it from different perspective. Let's use satellite data and use that, uh, you know, that indicator of um, or a critical slowing down to kind of then measure resilience. But then let's go back to the field and look at what is happening on ground. So to do that, we've constructed the state diagram for Northeast India. We've constructed these resilience maps for some landscapes. And we went back and we looked at uh, composition and structure of forests. Yeah. And like I said, ecosystems are complex and the way they respond to uh, perturbations are going to be complex. Every coral reef is not going to respond the same way to forest. A forest in Meghalaya, Balpakram National Park, which is one of the places where we studied, is not showing us the same response as Nongkhilam National Park, uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, which is just in a different, so uh, Balpakram is in West, right? And Nongkhilam is somewhere central Meghalaya they both don't show the same kind of response, right? And even the structure is slightly different. Nongkilam has a lot more bamboo than Balpakram does. So even small things like that, I mean, from our preliminary just combing through our data, we are finding some differences, which means that simply relying on these large scale maps, while very useful at some level, will, be, uh, will need to be supplemented with this kind of data to kind of make more uh, useful predictions. Um, we know that we need to look at them both top down and bottom up because any loss of these ecosystems is going to be catastrophic, both for us and for uh, the 
organisms that use these landscapes. Um, looking ahead, like I said, we'd like to kind of uh, look at these landscapes, see what is causing these high and low resilience values. Uh, what is about these forests? What is their history? What has been, uh, you know, ha have they been logged in the past? What does it mean then for maybe giving logging permits in the future, things like that? Um, yeah, and can we actually restore our landscapes to some sort of functionality that allows them uh, to be resilient? Yeah, okay. With that, again, I'd like to thank all these people, uh, especially our field team, our uh, local collaborators from the forest department, mostly both at Nongkhilam and well, Bal Pakram without whom none of that fieldwork would have been possible. Yeah, and I'm happy to take questions. And I stuck to my promise and there were no numbers given to you. <laughs> Hello. No, thank you very much for that excellent talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a couple of questions if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, the first is, do you have any published work um, on this particular system? As I know, there's um, a group back in Bristol that would be very interested in what you're doing. Um, and they're looking to do similar questions, but using a combination of satellite and LIDAR, um, yeah. in, in, but basically in Europe and in Indonesia. Yeah. So first of all, uh, we do have the first bit of the work is published already. Uh, so where is that? Yeah. Yeah, so we've published this, we've, where we've characterized the state diagram, we are currently, like I said, refining our um, uh, code for this to make sure that everything is hopefully in the next, fingers crossed, I'm scared to look at Vishu, but maybe next six months we'll have a paper, at least, yeah. But um, coming to the question of LIDAR, you, know, you didn't ask a question, but I'm going to preempt a question. Um, we really don't have LIDAR data for Indian data, uh, for Indian ecosystems at all. A, they're expensive. Uh, they're really expensive to get data for. Uh, and so we don't have LIDAR data. Something like LIDAR would be change our world. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wasn't expecting you to have it, um, uh, but I know this group are looking to expand okay. into other sites okay. um, and provide that LIDAR capability. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, so um, I'll maybe catch up with you and get their contact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my second question was, more, so I work in lake ecosystems to ask, ask similar questions and kind of identify regime shifts um, similar in, in the loss of resilience as you're working with. Um, and I also use similar um, techniques to identify that by stability where you've got the environmental parameter versus state variable. Um, but one question that I've been doubting myself about um, is whether the um, the particular measure of EVI in your case can be used um, in combination with these uh, critical slowing down indicators because most of the theory has been based on abundance and I wasn't quite sure how well the theory holds for these higher level um, ecosystem state measures that we are currently using. Okay, so um, very good question, uh, but it seems like it holds up. So when we look at, um, I don't know, I don't know if anybody has actually done the analysis where they've looked at actual measures of tree cover with satellite derived measures of tree cover. So I don't know. We are hoping it holds up is where we are at. We know from other studies at smaller spatial scales that EVI is generally a decent uh, uh, metric of tree cover. It uh, performs reasonably well, slightly better than NDVI, I think. Uh, but given all the other metrics that or indices that we have, EVI seems to be a good one. So the thing with NDVI and EVI is that beyond a certain threshold uh, tree cover, they're uninformative, right? Whether you have 80%, 90%, or 100%, it's very difficult for us to distinguish. So um, let me just quickly show you. Uh, I don't unfortunately have, okay, maybe here I can use this picture. You look at this, right? You could maybe shove in five more trees there, right? But for EVI, they'll all, it'll still show you the same value of EVI. So within a certain constraint, it performs relatively well. And I think it's enough to make these broad predictions, which is why I think we have to go back to field. Yeah. yeah. Um, with, with the um, the early warning signal stuff specifically, I was wondering whether biomass is appropriate to use and tree cover rather than count of um, plants or whatever, um, uh, level of interest that you're interested in. Yeah, you're saying biomass as opposed to abundance. Yeah, definitely. Biomass would, I think, be a better estimate uh, of, yeah, definitely. Has anyone shown that 
biomass or, or tree cover specifically has shown critical slowing down? Not to the, not to my knowledge. Can you repeat your question? Um, has biomass, so but these higher state levels, been shown analytically to show critical slowing down? Because most of the measurements have been done at the abundance scale. So usually the models assume actually biomass dynamics. So I mean the models don't really care what your state variable is. It could even be the cover. It could also be biomass. It could be the abundance, as long as it shows a bifurcation diagram, right? So models really do not distinguish these. Uh, subtle differences. Yeah. Thank you. you know, um, just to finish from the field, no, models maybe, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, there is tendency of uh, deploying more and more satellites and obtaining higher and higher resolution data. But of course, with um, biodiversity studies, you don't need to monitor the, uh, the amount of biomass every day because it will be kind of out of correlation, always one, 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 critical. And, uh, so uh, from your experience, what is the right resolution if you had ideal abundant data? what would be right temporal resolution and duration of the data to conclude about the resi resilience um, phenomena? Thank you for that question. Uh, so I agree with you. The 16 day data actually seems like an overkill, right? Because you are getting a lot of periods where you have a lot of autocorrelation, especially within seasons, right? Uh, which is why we wanted to do this. Let's try one image per year. Let's try two images, maybe in two different seasonal uh, maybe one in the summer, one in the monsoon. Uh, the reason why I didn't show that is because coding that in, G, in the Google Earth engine, I was having some issue with it. But I, so I don't know a definitive answer as to which would be a better temporal resolution, but 16 day may be an overkill. So I'm assuming that if we can get maybe two data points per year, which correspond to two phenological seasons, maybe a dry season and a wet season, uh, that might be enough, I think. Uh, in giving us, uh, because like you said, autocorrelation function will be highly correlated within a season. So, so far, people have been using 20 years. Uh, we've also used 20 years. Uh, and I think, honestly speaking, the longer the better, because from uh, previous studies from the field, we know that uh, somebody has mapped out how long does it take for different tropical forests to recover. And it looks like, and we have data only, I think from Malaysia, where there was one data point. And they've based on that, they've predicted that Asian ecosystems can take anywhere between 100 to 400 years to show uh, recovery to what would be considered old growth forest functioning. Uh, given that 20 years seems like a nothing, right? And we've, uh, in my own work, uh, in other projects that I've done, we've looked at recovering forests, which are 15 and 20 years old. They don't look a lot like the old growth forest. So I'm assuming we need a lot of data to actually see a recovery, right? Because they take a long time. So right now data sets, good quality data sets span about 30, 35 years. So all of it would be my, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, uh, let us thank Priya again for a very fascinating talk, looking at, you know, a very local scale to broad scale data sets in the context of tipping points. Thanks Priya again. Thank you.